are listening to Light Hearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. Today is August 6th, 2023, and this is episode 237 of Light Hearted. We have just one guest today, and it's someone regular listeners will be very familiar with. Today's episode is a conversation I had recently with Jeff Gales, Executive Director of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Our conversation was pretty wide-ranging. We talked about foghorns and their changing role in the world. We talked about the origins and history of the U.S. Lighthouse Society and the move from San Francisco to Point No Point Light Station in Washington. We talked about the Society's tours on the Passport Program and overnight stays at the Society's properties and other lighthouses. We also talked about the importance of getting young people to visit and experience lighthouses. And we talked about a lot of other things, too. It's always fun talking about uh, all things lighthouses with Jeff Gales. This was no exception. So let's listen to my conversation with Jeff Gales now. Hi, Jeff. How's it going? Good. How are you, Jeremy? Good, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful weather out here in New Hampshire after a hot stretch. We've got perfect, perfect summer weather at this point. How are things in the Northwest? Always beautiful in the summer here. We we live in paradise. Yeah, Yeah. I'll take your word for it. I'm usually there in the off season, so but it's it's still uh, beautiful uh, in its own way. So uh, first of all, uh, getting started here, you just uh, mentioned to me that you got a really interesting letter. Tell me about that. What's that all about? Yeah. So you know, we we, people write to the society all the time. Few things stand out. There are a lot of myths regarding lighthouse history uh, out there, and you know, one of my personal goals is try to dispel myths. Uh, for instance, I there's a myth out there that says uh, lighthouse Fresnel lenses were transported across the Atlantic Ocean in uh, in vats of molasses. Have you ever heard that one? No, I don't think I have. I've heard yeah. about them going around, <clears throat> being transported around Cape Horn to get to the West Coast. Yeah, but... no, I've read that before. And uh, obviously that's a complete myth. And you know, the lenses come apart and they go into crates, what have you. But, you know, things like that, we like to try to dispel and not, uh, you know, but Fresnel is pronounced Fresnel and not Fresnel, that type of thing. Anyways, I get this letter in the mail from a woman who's a longtime member with us since the very beginning. And she mm-hmm. was annoyed with the society. She felt that we abandoned the fog signals in the Bay Area when we moved to Washington and fixed up Point No Point as our headquarters. Mm-hmm. They had been silenced and she missed them. And so because of that, uh, she felt... She wasn't going to support us anymore. I mean, she sent me a very amicable letter, but it was because of this, I'm doing this. So I responded back to her after consulting with Wayne Wheeler and uh, the fog signals in the Bay Area, like with most places in the U.S., were being decommissioned as early as the 1970s. By the time the Lighthouse Society moved its headquarters in 2008, the Mm -hmm. only fog signals that could be heard were coming from, well, one from the Golden Gate Bridge, which has one attached to it. And the second type of fog signal that can be heard were shipboard fog signals, uh, as you're familiar with, right? You have those. Oh, yeah. Sure we do. Yeah. They're loud. Those. Yeah, they're loud. And so people at Point No Point, even to this day, will call us to tell us to turn off the fog signal because it's disruptive or whatever. And we have to politely tell them, I'm sorry, it's coming from a ship. We don't, the fog signal at Point No Point is no longer active. So I wrote her back a letter uh, quoting Wayne. Um, In fact, I also explained to her that the society was very active in helping try to preserve fog signals around the country. I mean, it's a very important part of lighthouse history. Mm -hmm. And um, that if she chooses to not to support us, please not don't not support us because of a misunderstanding. And I explained to her one other little factoid here. There's a lighthouse in the East Bay called East Brother Island. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Absolutely. Well, they actually have one of the last remaining actual historic foghorns left in the country that's still working. And one of the society's original board members, Walter Fanning and Wayne Wheeler, were Mm -hmm. the ones who, right around the early 80s, saved that lighthouse, took it over from the Coast Guard, and guess what? Preserve the foghorn. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, we've been trying to preserve all aspects of lighthouse history. And I'm just now waiting. I keep asking my uh, people in my office, I wonder when I'm going to, when or if I'll hear back from this person about the fog signals. 
of course, I'm not going to mention any names, but I, I hope that she comes around. And I mean, it's an emotional thing, right? I mean, it is a local community loses the sound of a foghorn that it maybe was generational. It makes a big impact. Don't you agree? I absolutely agree. And I get emails from people sometimes saying, oh, I miss the old foghorns. Why don't we hear them anymore? And uh, I don't think most people uh, are familiar with the fact that, as you said, a lot of them have been decommissioned. They've actually been turned off permanently, but the old fog horns are gone, the old uh, air horns and so forth. But we have electronic horns, and these days they have what they call the MRAS system, so people actually activate them with their VHF radios from their ships and boats. And I find that they don't get much, much use at all. Yeah. Um, I just uh, uh, talked to a, a reporter on, in Maine about that. Um, she was doing a article about that system. Did you talk to her too? I think I told yeah. her to call you. She, yeah, <laughs> yeah, she did. It was actually it was a short article, but it, it kind of uh, yeah, it, it was know, good. I, it was I, good. I wanted yeah. to point out the reason why the Coast Guard was deactivating foghorns. I mean, she wanted some reasoning behind the 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 decision. And yeah. uh, then, of course, I wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit more about this technology where you, know, you approach an island, you can click your radio, whatever pattern, and it turns on the foghorn. And the same technology actually used for private aircraft where they can at night click a, the radio at a certain frequency and the, the runway lights light up so they can yes. land. Yep. But uh, that, that's a great system. But like you said, our mariner is really using it and I'm, I'm not sure i don't not know. much it, not much but it is it is better it's a better choice than running those fog signals off the coast of maine 24 7 yeah which Coast Guard have been doing for many years yeah there's still i think at least a couple in maine that are on 24 hours but pr pretty remote they're not like anywhere near people's houses or anything like that but still hopefully over time those will be modified too because the yeah. Listen, they have to do, the U.S. Coast Guard, and I have full respect for them, they have to do what's best for navigation and safety. But there's got to be a better way than running those 24-7. I mean, I realize they're remote, but the sound from those foghorns, I, I mean, I, it's bothersome to humans, of course. Yeah. But I'm sure it's kind of problematic for you know local wildlife and what have you. I mean, you don't want to have that sound going all the time if you can avoid it. Yeah. Well, again, they're not as loud as they were back in the days of going way back to steam horns and then air compressed air horns. Yeah, I actually, I have a good, I can imitate one of those uh, modern fox signals pretty good. Here, this is what they sound like. Okay. I'm, I'm not hearing you. Oh, no. Okay, we'll try it again. Here, let's try one more time. It fades right out. It's oh, that's the beginning weird. of it. Like Zoom thinks that's a weird, a note, like foghorn in the background and it, it uh, <laughs> cancels it right out. Okay, so well, I'll, I'll, um, if somebody wants to hear my foghorn impression, they're just going to have to call me. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, okay, well, let's uh, move on from there. But, you know, um, just uh, to finish this discussion of fog signals, I have to wonder, you know, as we're saying, people don't use them much anymore. Are the days of fog signals numbered at this point? I know the country of Ireland just shut off all their foghorns maybe 10 years ago. And I think maybe there's at least a couple other countries that have done that. And I wonder if we're heading that way as well, because lighthouses still have their place in navigation, not as centrally as they once did, but certainly still have have a role. But uh, fog signals, I'm not so sure about that anymore. Fog signals now, it seems like shipboard fog signals are used as basically you're a car horn. You know, hey, I'm here, watch out. You know? uh, exactly. Yeah, you so don't want to be in the really way. Used, they're not used for navigation anymore. So. I don't and, think And, so. you know, today, uh, a ship, if it's heavy fog, they're not going to anchor down and wait till it passes. They keep going because they can navigate with GPS or what have you. So, you know... Bad weather in the sense of fog doesn't necessarily slow down ships nowadays. Yeah, be interesting to hear if we if see if we hear from anybody on this topic. Uh, I know I I hear if there were some smaller boaters, you know, lobstermen and people like that who still like the fog signals, but I never hear them anymore. When I'm near uh, one of these lighthouses, the signal I it's been it's been at least a couple of years since I've heard anybody actually activate the horns. Yeah, so, a, I said East Brother Island on the. East Bay of San Francisco, they'll blow demonstrate it for people, but they right. don't do it all the time. And that's the ones you're going to hear. The classical fog runs you hear are ones that people, nonprofits, historical sites, whatever, people who actually have members who are technically capable of maintaining these old fog runs. I mean, you have to have a level of mechanical knowledge in order to keep these things running. I mean, 
I consider myself to be a lighthouse geek, but ask me to uh, maintain and service a historic foghorn. I mean, I have no skills in that in that field. So, you know, preserving a historic foghorn is one thing. Finding people to actually keep them up is another. There's also a few other ones, I believe, uh, on the Great Lakes. Uh, mm -hmm. One in particular in Lake Michigan. I can't remember the name of the lighthouse, but they're around. And actually, uh, Gary Riemenschneider, uh, who's one of our volunteers, great guy who has helped us with the website, he recently uploaded uh, a, a section, uh, a selection, I should say, of historic fog signal uh, tones that mm -hmm. uh, people can go and access. In fact, um, we'll be announcing that shortly. Uh, oh, wow. Send the link out to people. So, you know, you can listen to, you know, half dozen, eight different styles of historic fog horns, which is kind of cool. Cool. I have Thatcher Island, Massachusetts, recorded in the 1980s by me just a couple of years before the fog signal building and all the equipment was wiped out by the uh, perfect storm in 91. <laughs> so, well, what, did, what did that sound like? Uh, I mean, what uh, you <laughs> and I heard that. <laughs> okay, approximately like that. It was an air horn. It was incredible. I was shooting it with my VHS uh, camcorder and the picture just goes kablooey when the horn goes off because it was the sound was too loud for the camera to deal with. So the picture actually goes crazy. It's kind of, you funny. know, it's interesting The uh, I've been reading about sound waves and uh, how scientists are proving that uh, basically everything is made of waves. And you can imagine, obviously you can't see them, but you can imagine how powerful the waves coming from that 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 foghorn at Thatcher Island to impact your camera? Oh my mm -hmm. God! And then what is it doing to us as human beings? Those those sound waves vibrating through our bodies. Who knows? What yeah, it's what did it do to the lighthouse keepers of old? Right. Yeah. Well, in the, you know we uh, we know for a fact that the foghorns on light ships were spe especially nasty and mm -hmm. loud, and a lot of light ship personnel went hard of hearing. That's mm -hmm. a fact. So. Well, at Lighthouse Keepers, too, I knew a, a guy who uh, just passed away a couple years ago, Jim Pope, who was a keeper, Coast Guard keeper, late 50s into the early 60s at Whaleback Lighthouse near here. Mm -hmm. And he was very hard of hearing. And the fog signal building, which was next to the lighthouse, attached to it, fog signal tower, the noise in there was deafening. And they, the, the temperature supposedly got up to 140 degrees when the machines were running inside that building. Is that because so. it was originally a wood-fired compressor no i'm talking about when it was uh oil engines and air compressors it's still hot though yeah yeah wow. very hot yeah, wow. yeah it was brutal yeah um, i mean if you go down into even modern ships i recently i went with uh our president mike vogel to the uh maritime conference in astoria oregon which is a, an amazing place to go visit if people don't know about astoria i just read a book about its history and it was basically the first american colony on the west coast I mean, it's a longer history than that, but it's it's fascinating. I mean, we went, to, we got a chance to tour a Coast Guard cutter, and we went down into the engine room. And even with the engine off, it was hot down there. And they were telling us even today, the temperatures in those engine rooms could get up over a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And I thought, oh my God, mm -hmm. even on modern ships today, that they can't control the heat down there. Just one more thing on uh, ship uh, engine rooms that I have to say, since you brought that up, a little bit of trivia for you. You know, the scenes in the movie Titanic, where you see the guys working in the engine room. You've seen the movie Titanic, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The scenes where you see the guys. In fact, there's one scene where DiCaprio and Kate Winslet run through the engine room. I don't know if you remember that, but you see the guys mm -hmm. working on the machines and everything. Those scenes were uh, actually filmed on the Jeremiah O'Brien, one of the Liberty ships uh, built during it's World War II. It's in San Francisco. Yeah. It was built in South Portland, Maine. They, uh, instead of rebuilding all this equipment, they decided to film those scenes on there. So a little bit of I, trivia. I think that makes Getting, sense. And certainly yeah. authentic, right? <laughs> pretty much a little bit later than the Titanic, but that's okay. So we're getting maybe a little bit away from the topic of lighthouses, and we should probably circle back to that. But And you brought up earlier the, the early days of USLHS, and you mentioned Wayne Wheeler. I thought maybe we could chat a little bit more about that. Are the society is going to be 40 years old next year. Is that, is that yeah, correct? 40 years old. And I was actually thinking about this because I was I was writing a uh, a letter recently to somebody about the Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000, and um, I wanted to find out if the society had any role in 
helping to get that passed. And sure enough, when I first consulted with our, our resident historian, uh, uh, Wayne Wheeler, who has the uh, history of the Lighthouse Society stash in his memory, uh, sure enough, the Lighthouse Society was involved in all the discussions. Uh, in fact, Wayne personally met with the National Park Service and the Coast Guard and a few other people in mm -hmm. D.C. He even remembers they met at the historic old post office in D.C. and hashed out the bill that was presented to Congress and finally passed. And it really made me feel proud that I worked for an organization like that, that, you know, Wayne and the board at that time had the forethought to help prevent lighthouses from just going to private parties. And I'm not saying that, you know, that if Jeremy Dontremont picked up a lighthouse from the Coast Guard, he wouldn't do the right thing and preserve it. But you know what? Once it becomes a private property, there's zero control that any of us have over that property. So the idea of keeping them open to the public and uh, kind of vetting organizations before they get transferred to make sure they can have a plan first to preserve them and then have a uh, can actually do it, I, I think it's an amazing accomplishment. I mean, it's one of the most important lighthouse preservation accomplishments, I think, in the in the United States to date. And hopefully there'll be more coming because there's still so much we need to do. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Uh, well, the USLHS was really at the forefront. Uh, in fact, the, the society is uh, by far the oldest large lighthouse organization in the country, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the only, only one that has the scope of a national, our scope's national. I mean, you have a lot of regional organizations and you have a lot of local organizations, but and you have some organizations in the United States that kind of touch nationally, but our reach is to all parts of the United States, which is which is unique. It started, of course, the society started in San Francisco. Wayne started it there. And he started it, he's him and his wife Sally. Okay. You can't right. forget Sally. Uh, who uh, basically helped them in every way, started the society on their dining room table in their house in San Francisco while he was still working for the U.S. Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the society became more successful, and Wayne tells the story about how he had to make a decision. He was given basically from his superior officer a decision to make, either drop the society and keep working for the Coast Guard because the society is taking up so much, much of your time, mm -hmm. or you know, retire early and, you know, move with, into the society full time. And that's what he chose to do. And they ended up getting a small office, I think, close to their house in San Francisco, eventually moving to the financial di district uh, in the city. And uh, there's actually a history, a chronological history of events on our website, if people are interested, which kind of lists the year by year changes up until the present time, which is kind of interesting to read. Yeah. And speaking of changes, remind me when the move was from San Francisco to Point No Point in Washington? 2008. 2008. Yeah, yeah. So right in the middle of the real estate crisis, we decided to shift, which actually wasn't a bad thing. I mean, the society was paying a lot of money uh, to rent a very small office in the financial district in San Francisco. You know, the rent that we were paying uh, was just going to support a wealth, already wealthy landlord, which is you know, okay, but... When uh, Point No Point presented itself as an option, in fact, Eleanor Dwyer, one of our board members, and uh, at the time she was heading up uh, an organization called the Washington Lighthouse Keepers Association, mm -hmm. and she's also a published author, made us aware of the availability of Point No Point. And after some uh, some conjoling, we managed to convince the county and the Coast Guard to let us move there, and it's been super positive. And the one thing I love about it is that Whatever money we generate out there for point no point, whether it's through the vacation rental or whether it's through the uh, rent that we pay, which is minimal, all that money goes into a line item on the county budget supporting the maintenance of point no point. So in essence, whatever money we pay to exist as an organization goes back into the facility, it. goes to support our core mission of lighthouse preservation. To me, that was a win-win scenario. And of course, I do love San Francisco. Uh, I do miss San Francisco, but I feel like that uh, I made a really good move up to Puget Sound. It's just such a, an amazing uh, area. Uh, we couldn't be happier. And I think most people who come visit us at Puget Sound, you know, who visited us in San Francisco to do research or whatever, enjoy the experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before we moved, 
I had to do all these uh, reports, you know, the, you know, how far away from, are we from fire service and police service, you know, how long would it take, you know, somebody to get to us if they wanted to do research from the airport, so to speak. I calculated that the time it takes somebody to land at SFO, San Francisco, and get to our offices in San Francisco to say, do you research or visit? We were only talking about a difference of 20 minutes flying into Seattle and getting mm -hmm. to our headquarters at, at, at point, no point. So, you know, the, the timing, although we seem more remote now, actually getting to us wasn't actually all that more difficult for most people. The most important thing for me in proposing the move was that the money we spend to exist as an organization goes to support lighthouse preservation. I feel like that is the most important thing we can be doing with, with that money. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. I agree. So you were the, you've been the director, executive director for, for how many years now? Well, um, I started volunteering with the society in the early 2000s uh, when I was the manager at a point arena lighthouse. I took a job out there basically as their, they didn't really have a title. It was basically lighthouse manager, but I helped, you know, with the museum displays and I helped with running the organization and running the reports and development, uh, fundraising. And I found out about the U.S. Lighthouse Society because I wanted to do research about Point Arena and they were in San Francisco, which is only a couple hours away. So on the weekends, I would drive into the city just to get a city fix in Point Arena. Is in the, that is in the middle of nowhere. You're talking, when I was there, it was 500 people in town. And, you know, it, it was nice to get away from all of the people who knew everything about your personal life. Um, <laughs> So uh, anyways, I started volunteering with the society, helping them with various aspects of the, you know, their database, filing, whatever, and eventually was offered the job as the society's first executive director and started working for them in 2004. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, early 2000s when I started actually helping. And uh, it's been great ever since. It's just been such a dream come true for me, for sure. And for people who might be wondering, where, where are you from originally? Originally, I was born and raised in Southern California, Los Angeles County, yeah. and I didn't know about lighthouses at all. And there actually are a few really cool lighthouses in California. Oh, Point yeah. Lula, Point Vicente, Point Furman. Going yeah. further north, there's the Point Wainimi, and But uh, lighthouses were not on my radar at that, at that time, for sure. And it wasn't until I moved to uh, Eureka, California, where I bought my first house, that I saw an ad in the Eureka Times Standard. Uh, I've always followed classified ads. I'm kind of a classified ad junkie. And uh, uh, saw an ad for the manager at Point Arena and uh, applied for the job. I already had another job in Eureka, but I applied for that job because I thought Ooh, living at a lighthouse, working out there, that'd be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And got the job and that started me off on my path with lighthouse history. So I didn't plan for it, but it was a happy accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you? How did you get started in it? Huh. Well, I'll, I'll maybe say a little bit, but I don't want to get too deeply into it because I, uh, I've already been interviewed on this podcast by Bob Trapani, and I gave a lot of my background. So I don't want to bore people with that again. But briefly, I'm from the Boston area, just north of Boston, Lynn, Massachusetts. And uh, I don't know anything about lighthouses, but I loved the ocean as a kid. I wanted to be a marine biologist for uh, some years when I was a kid. Um, and then uh, I became a big fan of the historian Edward Rowe Snow, who used to be on Boston radio and TV all the time. I would love hearing his stories of shipwrecks and pirates and stuff. And sometimes he'd mention lighthouses. And then in the 1980s, when I lived in Winthrop, Massachusetts, that's where Edward Rowe Snow was from. I ended up uh, producing a series of videos about his life for the local access cable the TV station, got to know his wife and daughter really well. I met him a couple of times when he was alive. But um, anyway, so that really started me going. I like to say it snowballed, Edward Rose Snow, snowballed, you know, snowballed yeah. from there, uh, pun intended. But yeah. um, well, I think uh, what you mm -hmm. said uh, is true with most people who are members of the society that I've met that all of us are drawn to the ocean in some respect. I don't know what it is. I always had been. Uh, the days in my youth when I used to be able to go to the beach were always the best days I could spend, you know, obviously on uh, my days off. So something about the ocean, I think, does call to all of us. 
I totally agree. Something about being human. I think humans in general are drawn to the ocean. I can't imagine. I mean, obviously, a large part of our population lives in the middle of the country. I can't personally imagine that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been close to the coast my whole life and uh, absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving on, let's talk a little bit more about USLHS. We, you and I and Mike Vogel spoke recently on the podcast, and we talked quite a bit about the tour, so I'm not sure if we want to do that a lot right now, but it's, it's such a big part of what the society does. And well, you... I think most people would be interested to know that tours are basically an accident. They were never really, just like the passport program, uh, Wayne Wheeler decided he's going to start a passport stamp program for going to see lighthouses, which exploded uh, to the point where, you know, we're 20 to 30,000 passports pass through our office every year. And there's a lot of people out there with passports donating money to lighthouses, getting their passport stamps. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a huge group of people who are having fun with, you know, under the, and the whole point was to actually to get people to go out and visit lighthouses. You know, Wayne's uh, uh, mantra was our new members, people are going to support the Lighthouse Society are those people who are going to go visit lighthouses. So let's do something which encourage them to go visit. And certainly the Password Club does that. But the tours were an accident. Uh, Wayne was actually invited by the government of Russia to bring a group out years and years ago. To, I think it was actually 1984 or 85, it was in the mid 80s, mm -hmm. to visit their maritime centers and lighthouses, some of them. And yep. he got a group of about 30, maybe 35 people together and uh, did this trip. And that kind of sparked the idea about going to see more lighthouses. And of course, in those days, lighthouses were much more difficult to access. A lot of them were closed to the public or restricted by the Coast Guard. So, you know, with Wayne's uh, contacts, he was able to get the keys, so to speak, and people were able to get out to these remote lights that were closed for the most part. And uh, it blossomed from there to where, you know, the society would, you know, we would do a handful of tours every year you know, as an example, uh, you know, we'd, we'd, do, we'd see Maine, uh, Outer Banks, Door County, San Francisco Bay, and uh, there's one other one. Oh, yeah, Cape Cod. Those five tours operated every year with a waiting list for many, many years. And, of course, he would add on different trips uh, around, the, around the world, started going to Europe more. And the tours actually became a hugely important part of our uh, the way we support our, our mission and support lighthouse preservation. So, you know, membership, of course, uh, is super important. That makes up a nice percentage of our operating income. But the tours and the passport program are equally as important. Those uh, make up also big portions of our, our annual budget. And, uh, of course, expanding our membership, growing our membership, is key to us growing the uh, the tour the tours because we need to increase the population of the society's membership in order to offer and be able to uh, populate more trips. So mm -hmm. they're both yeah. very well, they're very, the membership and tours are very connected. Absolutely. So uh, just to touch on uh, tours going on currently, I think uh, a lot of the tours uh, this year are sold out. Yeah. Well, you know, to me, I, the interesting thing, one of the interesting points about Lighthouse Society tours that's, developed recently is yep. this idea of incorporating cruises with our tours. So like recently we did a tour of Iceland. Well, we've yep. done a number of Iceland tours that were land-based. Well, this one circumnavigated the entire country in a luxury cruise ship. And that made it much more, uh, well, the fact that we were able to uh, circumnavigate the island in a cruise ship made it possible for us to see many more things than we would have on a land-based tour. So, uh, you know, next year, uh, we've always wanted to operate a trip to the Caribbean. Never could yeah. quite figure out how to make it work. Well, guess what? It's a cruise ship. That's, uh -huh. what, that's the key. That's the key part of this is making the Caribbean work is our hotels, a cruise ship, and it's going to be a fabulous trip. But I think that's, that's a more recent, development. You know, we used to do these small cruises. And we took a group out to the Hebrides in northern Scotland. Yep. We've taken groups out in a tugboat to see lighthouses on the Great Lakes. Sure. Um, they've, they've been like 12 person tours basically. We've done a 12, 15 person tour to the Greek islands. Well now with the with the ability to use the larger ships, 
we can do the same thing with more people, which is good because we don't want to limit the number of people that want to register for the tours. We want to be inclusive. Yeah. But the, cruises really... are, the cruises are a new, a, new, a new thing, which I'm excited about. Yeah. Oh, it's a really, it's a really neat angle on it. And mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine doing it even in, in this, in the U.S., to have a, a New England cruise, you know. Uh, I used to do cruises. I, I used to be a guest lecturer on uh, American Cruise Lines, what they called the Grand New England Cruise, did it for about mm -hmm. five years, 10-day cruise along the New England coast. But the USLHS could charter something like that people who travel with us they love it when we can spend more than one night in a hotel you know you, we don't have to unpack and pack every day which sometimes you know you do to get to see what you want to see so certainly when you're on a cruise you know being in the same hotel for an entire week is a very much a luxury yes so. yes in fact i i was just the leader on the long island new york tour in may and we were in the same hotel at the same time which was amazing it made it so there you much go. easier yeah yeah Yep. Speaking of staying overnight at places, a while ago you mentioned uh, the the uh, overnight stays at Point No Point, and actually uh, part of the Keeper's House is available for that. There's also another uh, little house on the property where I, I stayed when I was there recently. Uh, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that for people who might not know about, but also Point Wilson, uh, yeah. which the society has developed as a, with overnight accommodation. Well, I think this ties into a larger program that we that we offer, which is when a lighthouse is picked up by a nonprofit or historical society, one of the first calls most people make is to the U.S. Lighthouse Study. And we're, we're out there, people know we're a resource, you know, and there's no sense reinventing the wheel, you know, let us help you, especially if you have no experience with nonprofit management, let us help you get this thing set up. So one of the things we, we moan about is you need to try to figure out a way to make yourself self-sufficient. And if there are and create income streams. So if there's a way for you to set up a vacation rental at your lighthouse, that's a really good way to do it. And relatively Absolutely. Easy. yeah. So our vacation rentals at in Puget Sound tie into all the vacation rentals at lighthouses and around the country. And there's quite a few. There's so many, as a matter of fact, we came up with a uh, a database that you can access on our website. It's by state where you can see all the different lighthouse lodging availability. And the Point Wilson and Point No Point just happen to be ones we're associated with. But anytime you stay at a lighthouse and pay money to do so, it's a really great way to support the lighthouse preservation of that particular property. And you have an amazing time at the, you know, I'm staying at a lighthouse is completely unique. I mean, if you go to Airbnb or VRBO, you'll see very few lighthouses because they're just not, available necessarily mm -hmm. uh, through the to the mass public and you really got to know where to find them and that's a great resource uh, our website is uh, is uh, a great resource for finding those out of the way secretive lighthouses to stay at yes yes well, I agree with all that and uh, I know when I've stayed at point no point which is three times now mm -hmm. uh, I uh, have made it a, a point pretty much every day to get up. And I don't do this at home either. I don't get up at sunrise at home. I should, but I don't. But when I'm at point, no point, I get up to see the sunrise over the sound and uh, it is spectacular. You know, the light, yeah, yeah, lighthouses are located in very unique geographic areas close to the ocean. And there's just something about visiting them and being there on off hours, you know, when there's not a lot of tourists and people around. Yes. Uh, you see things and experience things you wouldn't normally be able to with a bunch of other humans. I agree. I remember really one of the days when I was staying there just in, in this past April, I went outside. I was staying in the Mag's house on the property, which is a really mm -hmm. cool little place, and uh, stepped outside and there was a bald eagle right there, uh, perched on like a log, a drift, piece of driftwood on the beach, you know, probably 100 feet from me. It's, it's just an amazing place, really is. Well, we had, you know, in December, we had a major flooding out of Point No Point. The historic buildings were did okay. They survived without too much problems. Local community had some issues with flooding. But um, since then, uh, while the park is doing their engineering studies to deal with the parking lot issues, they worried that the parking lot was undermined with water and they don't want any sinkholes, the form, what have you. While they're doing all those studies, They've closed Point No Point Park to cars. So you can walk in yeah. with no cars. And I'm telling you the difference in the amount of wildlife 
with no cars and no hordes of people out there, it's increased, I would say 200%. It's incredible. So as before, where you might see a couple of eagles flying around, you'll see half a dozen. You'll see pods of whales closer to the, to the point. You'll see all the wild bird life where flocks, not just a few here and there, but flocks of all types of seabirds congregating on the beaches and what have you, because there's so few people. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Um, less people equals more wildlife. So if you really want to experience that, uh, definitely spend a night at a lighthouse because you'll be able to see it when as soon as the, all the people leave, all the animals come out. Yeah. Another thing I was going to mention when I was there in April, one of my favorite things that happened was I just happened to be outside uh, when this man was coming back from the, the beach there with a like a shopping cart. Uh, maybe you've met this man, but he goes and I guess a lot. I think he's retired. He's originally from Ireland. He had an Irish accent, but he goes and picks up the trash on the beach there. Uh, so he had a bag of trash in this cart that he was going to go dispose of. And uh, I guess he does this as a regular thing. And it was just really refreshing talking with him. You know, he has such an appreciation of the, the beauty of the place. Well, I think that holds true for any town that surrounds a lighthouse. Uh, you know, even though lighthouses for the most part are either U.S. Coast Guard or run by nonprofits or whatever, owned by an organization at this point, local communities still have very much a sense of ownership. It doesn't matter what the paper says. It doesn't matter what the deed says. The lighthouse belongs to the people of the town that surround it, and they have pride in it. As I said, we were talking about the fog signals before. This pride in the lighthouse properties can be generational. And so people will go out and pick up trash. They will help out however they can. They'll, they take care of the place. It mm -hmm. just comes naturally. And I feel the same way too. You know, I don't necessarily live, I live 20 minutes from point no point, but I very much have a sense of ownership of that location because I'm there all the time, but also because I care about it so deeply. It's It's become like my second home. And I think people who live close to lighthouses feel the same way all over the world. If you go all over the world, it's the same thing. Um, yeah. I don't think uh, anywhere uh, do people feel differently. People just in general are passionate about these lights. Yeah. Well, something certain, emotional about them. I agree. I'm yeah. certainly seeing that through the podcast uh, where I'm interviewing people all over this country, but even in other countries. I just interviewed two guys who run a, a lighthouse that's also a, a hotel and restaurant in South Africa, Seal Point. And uh, they are so uh, devoted to that place and doing it for the community, not just for themselves, but they employ local people, mm -hmm. uh, including unskilled labor. The jobs are hard to come by there. And at, they are at Point Arena, when I worked there, we employed mm -hmm. 15 people, local residents. And we like we we're one of the largest employers in Point Arena and uh, made a difference to the economy. People would come out to visit the town to see the lighthouse. So yep. lighthouses are definitely tied to local economy, for sure. Absolutely. Speaking of things being generational, uh, uh, you know, uh, and let me say, you know, there's always a million things you and I could talk about. Uh, so uh, we can't talk about everything in one conversation. But one of the things we do talk about a lot is how do we get young people interested in lighthouses? I mean, we put things out there on social media and uh, we have these Zoom events and the podcast and everything, but largely we're preaching to the choir. You know, we have certain people who follow us and are probably members of the society and so forth, so, which is great. We need those people. Uh, we appreciate those people. But there's always the question of, of how do we bring younger people into uh, the lighthouse world? How do we get them interested? And we haven't, I don't think we've quite cracked that nut yet so uh what are the things i'm trying to do with this dance contest we're having now is to get uh maybe some new people interested but any thoughts about that uh in general uh at this point well we started publishing uh a newsletter lighthouse fun for kids that seems to be popular uh you know pe people who are members of the society get the thing and they they're giving them to their kids or their grandkids most likely their grandkids at this point or they're passing them off to schools or neighbors, friends or whatever. But the uh, the dance contest is a really good idea. If you look at kids today, there's really a struggle with getting them. 
out of the house, off their devices. You know, how do you get a, a small child from lifting their head up from their phones and taking a look at the world, you know? And uh, I think your dance contest, and in essence, our password program, to a certain extent, does encourage that. It encourages uh, kids to get out and to experience things and to see new things. And, you know, getting to a lighthouse can be difficult. I mean, it takes effort for parents to, to make that happen. But I feel like once you get one or two lighthouses under your belt, at least this is the way it was for me, Yeah, you, know, you want to see more. You want to go visit more. It becomes a reason to uh, take a vacation or to go on a weekend break or even go for away for a day. It's those memories that kids make, which will make them want to become involved with maybe supporting a lighthouse or or volunteering or what have you. So, and the dance contest ties into that 100% because the dance contest, it's not just for kids, by the way, it's for all ages. Absolutely. But one of the awards we're giving away is basically a scholarship. It's, it's trying to attract a young person and saying, okay, hey, if you get out here and you do something fun and help draw attention to this historic landmark, you may win a cash prize that can support your education. I think that's awesome. And I think it's a great way to get people out to visit lighthouses. I think the, the dance contest is a is a brilliant idea. And I think you told me that it's actually fairly popular at this point. You've gotten some messages back from people who are participating. Yeah, we're getting good response. We, I've had, uh, I say I've heard from at least 25-ish lighthouse organizations who say they're going to take part, but also a number of individuals. Some of them are asking me to send them the song that uh, meet me at the lighthouse. People can get information, go to the front page of the website, uslhs.org, uh, under what's new, the dance contest is there. Click on a link for all the information. Yeah, so you had you had an actual song written, basically, special for this event by a local artist. Yeah. And the idea is that you play this song, everybody plays the same song at a lighthouse or close to a lighthouse or with a lighthouse in view. And mm -hmm. basically choreographs her own dance to this particular music. Yeah. Uh, chore I think we need to use the word choreograph loosely <laughs> because right. people can jump around, act silly, whatever they want to do, or they can get really into choreographing something a little more complicated. But, you know, if they just get a, a kid or two kids, three kids, 10 kids, or adults or a yeah, local a dance couple, school or whoever. A couple whoever. could do a dance, you know? It could Absolutely. be anything. Last time you did this, uh, I remember you had a, was it a group of cheerleaders or something? That well, that was uh, done on TikTok, and that was pretty much run by our friend Ralph Krugler. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that was at the Hillsboro Inlet Lighthouse in Florida. He got a group of, uh, I guess there were cheerleaders who, who did dance there. So that was a good example, and we're trying to expand it with, with this. And if it goes well, we'll take it maybe even further. I'm thinking maybe international in the future. Down the definitely. Road. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, we want to do something to celebrate Lighthouse, National Lighthouse Day. Yep. Yep. And to me in general, it's just a way of uh, showing good spirit, of showing uh, the interconnectedness of lighthouses and lighthouse people all over the country and show just kind of celebrating what we love about lighthouses. So that's right. And in the key, getting people out there visiting lighthouses. That's that's always been our our main goal. I agree. I agree. I remember talking to a guy back in uh, the 90s who was working to restore Butler Flats Lighthouse in New Bedford, Mass. And I'm talking to him on video at the top of the lighthouse. And I said, uh, why, why do you think people should want to come out here? And he said, all they have to do is come here once and they'll understand why it's important. And I always that always sticks in my mind. It's pretty much what you just said. Uh, you know, experience a, a lighthouse, you, you catch the lighthouse bug. Definitely. Uh, and there's something different, you know, I don't know if you've ever been on a trip. I remember when I went to the Grand Canyon, you know, I had seen pictures, but it wasn't until I was actually there that I felt the Grand Canyon. And I think lighthouses are the same way. You only can get so much from looking at photos. Physically being on site with all the sensations going uh, makes the difference. So if you're the type of person who loves photos and likes looking at photography or video, that's great. Some of the drone footage out there is amazing. But you're never going to get the same feeling as you get by actually visiting a lighthouse. You got to go. I totally agree. And I, I'm not tired of it by any means. When I get to go to a new lighthouse, it's, it's, I, yeah, I think my heart beats a little faster. It's still uh, as much of a thrill as it was I mean, 40 years ago. Absolutely. And you've never been to Cape Hatteras. Shame on you. 
Well, I, I, I'm hesitant to say that publicly, but we're going, <laughs> my wife and I are going in October. That's great. Uh, well, hopefully, I know the, it'll be, hopefully it'll be open. I know well, it won't be. It won't be. <laughs> but Body Island will be open and some of the other ones we're going to. But Cape Hatteras, I think, is at least another something like a year away from being. I remember Cape Hatteras. Uh, I had, it's been, it would, I was working for the Society for more than 10 years before I got a chance to go to Cape Hatteras. Of course, the tallest lighthouse in the country it had been relocated, has an amazing history. And uh, when I got to the door, uh, to go into the lighthouse to finally climb it after all those years, after reading about it and knowing about it, I got goosebumps. You know, it was I was a little nervous to climb that <laughs> lighthouse. But then I got to the top, of course, all my nerves were calmed. But I got excited about the adventure. And I think I do feel the same way as you about new lighthouses as well. Yeah, I just got to Montauk and Fire Island on that Long Island tour in May. And amazingly, I hadn't been to those before. And that that was a real thrill. Both of those are fantastic and lighthouses. Fire Island is pretty tall. It is, it is. And Montauk and is an amazing history. It's beautiful, both beautiful places. And going to Florida a couple of years ago to St. Augustine and Ponce Inlet lighthouses. Those are also absolute world-class lighthouses. So I've got a lot more to visit. I've been I've seen about 500, but there's many thousands more out there. And uh, I'll, I'll just mention our good friends, uh, Darlene and Tom Chisholm, who uh, have done so many of the, the USLHS tours and photographed well over 4,000 lighthouses. Uh, Tom passed away recently, but um, we, uh, we know them from, uh, I'm going to say, probably over 40 tours mm -hmm. over the years that they did. And I was told by somebody who's close to them that they're just the most wonderful people and my wife and I have become, you know, good friends. I've known him for many years at this point. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of Tom's uh, last wishes for Darlene was that she continue the adventure. And I thought to myself, well, that that really is the best way to to memorialize and honor Tom, to for all of us to keep it going and visit them, photograph them, enjoy them, and preserve them for future generations. I couldn't agree more. I just had on the uh, Long Island tour, they were on it in May, and I had a dinner, really nice dinner with them and got to know uh, more about their backgrounds and stuff. So I uh, have a really good memory of that. So uh, again, you know, there's a million things we could talk about, and we will over time. We'll get to everything eventually, but uh, I think there's about 849,000. So we got to <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's all, and there's always new things to talk about too. That's, uh, That's right. You know, but uh, anyway, thank you so much, Jeff. It's uh, always fun talking with you. We'll do this again in the not too distant future and uh, keep a good light. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Bye. If you enjoy this podcast, the Lighthouse Passport Program, or any of the many things the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers, I strongly urge you to become a member. All the info on becoming a member is on the Society's website at uslhs.org. In many ways, these are stressful times we live in, and people are divided over many things. But lighthouses stand as a reminder that people are capable of great altruism, kindness, and caring. They were built for no other reason than to protect ships and people on our waterways. In difficult times, we can look to lighthouses for inspiration. With that, I will remind you that we'll have a new episode next week. The subject will be Plum and Pilot Island Lighthouses in Wisconsin. Until then, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thanks so much for listening, and keep a good light. Mm -hmm.